My HR folks, anytime there's a new tool that's being introduced into the workplace, the first tendency is to say, well, HR, you take care of it. Right? It doesn't matter what it is. We've got problems in the parking lot. HR, you take care of it. <laughs> All right? There are pensions upstairs on the roof, you know, feeding. HR, get up there and take care of it. And we just run it. We run it, take care of it because we think as a service person, that's what we're supposed to do. Well, I want to change that sentiment because that's not true. Well, the group we work with today were small business entrepreneurs who um, work with Jan Hubbard and our Walsh Business Institute. And we sponsor this conference every year. I think it's nine years and nine years running now where we bring in small business family, family business owners and we put them through a series of workshops about specific issues, you know, your taxes, 401k, how to hire, you know, how to hire good people. Because these are the folks who tend to work with pretty limited resources. Uh, they're fundamental to the economy, but they tend to always have needs for something. And they run into, and family businesses run into some very unique issues because they're family business. <laughs> well, let me say afternoon. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot, Dr. Shields. Let me say good afternoon to all of you. You know, one of the problems with listening to yourself being introduced to a group is you don't, you don't really get a sense of how busy you are or or maybe I just can't keep a job. I'm not exactly sure <laughs> <laughs> which one it is, but in any event, I'm glad to be here. Loyalty is dead. No, <laughs> it's just transportable. <laughs> so we can move it from one place to the next. But think about what people do to ensure loyalty in a relationship. Well, being an employee in an organization is really about a relationship. And how strong is that relationship where no matter what's going on, I think about that before I think about my own self as well. One of the interesting th theories that we like to bounce back and forth, are leaders born or are they made? I'm going to make it a rhetorical question right now because I know you're not here for the lecture. So I'll tell you what we believe. We believe leadership can be taught. And that is a series of skills that we pull together in order to ensure that someone can be an actively involved leader. I love talking with human resource folks because that's my background. So anytime there's an opportunity to speak to human resources, for instance, we, um, we did the Michigan Society for Human Resources Management Conference in Grand Rapids not too long ago. Those are eight human resource folks from around the state of Michigan um, there to talk about particular topics that they're working on. So I left that and decided to go on human resources. Fortunately, I was able to get a job as a supervisor of human resources at a plant in Flint, Michigan back in 1984. Um, and it was a very exciting time for me. Um, they put me on the afternoon shift. There it is. Um, I walked into the plant. My plant personnel director called me into his office, he gave me a clipboard uh, with a pencil. And to start my orientation, he said, sit down, I want you to write this down. I sat down, ready to be invited into the world of human resources. He said, keep this statement in mind. People are morons. <laughs> right, I've worked with a number of folks over the years who take pride in the fact that I do nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. How was your day today? I did nothing. <laughs> what about yesterday? I did nothing. At the end of the week, I'm still doing nothing. And 15 years later, I'm still doing nothing. And isn't that a wonderful experience? Well, I guess it would be to get paid for doing nothing. Actually, what's made this kind of interesting is that um, I feel like I'm standing in front of the world's most dangerous people on the planet. And I'll tell you why I say, in fact, probably more dangerous than a teenager with a credit, with a credit card. <laughs> Only in that <clears throat> you, you, you represent those individuals who are willing to take risks and do things that others think about, or dream about, or imagine, or at the local bar, you know, throw down a few beers and go, boy, if I just had an opportunity to do this, I would do this. Well, where folks talk about it, you tend to do that. And so you've become a fascinating population to me. I have a great time talking in front of managers, because we, can we, take, some manage we take some managerial stuff, we kind of put it out there, and you know, managers always complain about working with people. And I always kind of look at them and say, yeah, I think that's kind of your job. <laughs> I mean, why do it if you're not going to work with people? But some of the issues that, you know, that, that they encounter when they're trying to do a good job and how do, um, how do they move from being good managers to effective leaders. 
This comes up every time Fortune 500 create, does a survey, every time Forbes does a survey, anytime they ask CEOs of companies, what's the number one skill that you look for in upcoming, up and coming leaders? And they always say, without exception, communication. Communication skills, all right? Not just the technical communication skills or the social media uh, communication skills in which you are also proficient, but that ability to do that ability to do one-on-one -on -one leadership, uh, leadership skills and communication skills as well. So we know you know how to tweet, and we know you know how to twit, and we know you know how to tweet, twat, and twit, whatever that is that you all do when you're doing that. How do we balance the tangible, the data, the information? How do we balance that with the intangible? And that is human behavior, that is, people doing stuff. And so with that, what do we find? <laughs> we find that we have a lot of folks in the workplace who are not happy. Now, here's one of the problems with that, gang. Um, I was raised under an old school father. And old school fathers didn't care if you were happy or not. Remember all this engagement we do, we do around you know, our kids now? Well, you know, let me, I want to spend some time talking with them. Let's reason. Now, now here's why you have to go to school. Here's why you have to get up in the morning. This is why I need to take the garbage out. Let's talk and engage and just make sure this happens. Well, I can't because like, I'm, I'm unhappy in life. And my father had, an, he had a whole answer to that. Um, say, well, Dad, I'm not happy. And guess who cares? <laughs> Uh, we had the, the good opportunity to do a, um, what we call a lunch and learn at our Novi campus in which we invited, again, human resource folks to come and talk about a specific issue that day. And that topic we were doing that day was influential leadership. Every time you have some kind of innovative idea, you need to know there are always naysayers. But good leaders aren't motivated by naysayers. They're motivated by the idea and the passion that drives the idea. And that's how they continue to move these things forward. So we've got traditionalists in the workplace working side by side with boomers. We got boomers working side by side with Generation X. We got Generation X working side by side with Generation Y. Generation Y working side by side with millennials. And I don't know who else is coming behind that. My son. <laughs> who, because he's become so masterful at games, downstairs in the basement, the only thing I can rationalize is that he's becoming a virtual project manager. <laughs> as I, because as I reflect back on my own personal experience, um, I've only known one bully in my entire lifetime, and that was my first girlfriend. <laughs> um, Carol chased me home from school one day because I was looking at her. She said, Lee, what are you looking at? I said, well, I wasn't looking at anything. And she got mad and chased me nine blocks to my home. I almost made it to the front door, but she tackled me as I got to the front steps. Proceeded to put a headlock on me while my mother was sitting on the porch. And mom looked out, and of course, being a mom, she said, Lee, what did you do? I said, mom, I didn't, I didn't do, you know, which is going to be a standard statement with men now. I didn't do nothing. My, um my 30 plus years in the business has taught me a lot of different things and I've seen a lot of some, some very interesting scenarios have unfolded. Uh, but it's from that audience that I pull a lot of my concepts. You, know, you spend a lot, we spend a lot of time talking with folks and over, over time certain things start to, emer start, start to emerge. So there's a conflict and one of two things happens. It creates would-be entrepreneurs who, recognizing the resistance, give up and stay and never go after their dream, or it creates those pure entrepreneurs who give up and leave and decide to pursue their dream as well. And that's a very small minority of folks who walk the planet, many of whom are in this room right now. So it, so it behoves me to begin to talk about, well, do some explanation. What does this particular thing look like? One of the other things, of course, that's going on from a leadership standpoint is the workforce is changing so dramatically right, in ways that we hadn't imagined could, was even possible. And so within that, part of what we attempt to do is to show you 
how you work with generational diversity in the workplace. Generational diversity. And here's what I mean by that. Individuals who represent four different generations, uh, veterans and boomers and Gen X, Y, and millennials. I was taught years ago that when individuals don't wish to perform, that what we should be doing is to help them leave. Because this isn't, that's a lot of what they're saying, aren't they? Right? I really don't want to be here. I'm really, not I'm really not happy doing the work that I'm doing. I'm really not as productive, but I'm going to stay here anyway. All right. Remember how we used to do that? Every one of us has had that in a relationship at some point in time um, because we thought we were in love. But it just turns out we were just being crazy. Because, it, you know, because I mean, your friends would always tell you, you know, he doesn't have a job. Oh, that's okay. He'll find one. <laughs> you know, every time you bring him around, he's got a negative attitude. Well, life's been tough. All right, he's always borrowing your car. Well, you know, he needs to be able to get around. And so I catch the bus. And so we begin to make excuses. <laughs> excuses for individuals who are being unproductive. One of the other things that becomes important is that as you're moving through this, you've got to differentiate. Now, I, I love the looks on your faces right now because everyone's going, how is he going to explain this picture? <laughs> what has this got to do with anything? Now, you got, there's a story there. There's a story there. All right? So dare to, dare to differentiate. Here's the story. I had one of those mornings with, that was absolutely perfect. My wife was at work. My son was at school. I had no work from Walsh. And I was just going to enjoy the morning. So I'd already poured my cup of coffee. I turned on you know, the reruns of NCIS and was just ready to settle in when I got a phone call from my wife. She said, honey, what are you doing? I said, I'm not doing anything. Now, every husband in the room is always sitting there going, only you violated husband living number one. <laughs> you're not supposed to ever admit that you're not doing anything. But she called me off guard, which violates rule number two. <laughs> you're not supposed to be off guard. This is your wife. So she caught me. <laughs> not doing anything and off guard. OK, well, I need you to do me a favor. All right, honey, what do you want me to do? I need you to run over to Macy's and get me some lipstick. Um, excuse me. <laughs> why do you need, before I do my presentation, why do you need lipstick for your presentation? Which I learned later on was not the question I was supposed to ask. The question I was supposed to ask was, uh, what flavor? <laughs> Is it a flavor? Yeah. What flavor? What? Okay. Um, and so she gave me, she gave me the name of, I had to write it down, and to this day I still don't remember. I don't know, you know, sailor, call me, or something. I don't know what it is. <laughs> So I wrote it down on the piece of paper. I drove over to Macy's. Now I'm walking through this, I'm, I'm walking through this area that is just inundated with all kinds of lipstick flavors, colors, or whatever. And I'm standing there, of course, looking with this, with this idiotic look on my face. And his one sales associate, boy, she took pity on me. She walked up and said, sir, may I help you? She said, I'm here to get lipstick for my wife. And she said, do you have your note? <laughs> Well, of course, we have a, you know, we have a website. Um, I go by the nickname The Lull Doctor. That's L-U-L-L-D-O-C-T-O-R, based on my book, um, Taking the Lull by the Horns, um, Filling the Leadership Gap. <laughs> you seem to enjoy yourself. I love this stuff. I love it. My wife once said to me, um, she said, you, enjoy, you really enjoy this, don't you? And I said, how can you tell? She said, because when, if we open the refrigerator, the light comes on, you'll do 10 minutes easily. So, uh, I'm <laughs> so, yeah, this is, you know, it's an op for me, it's always, an op it's always nice to get in front of a group and just talk about things that I hope are relevant to them and that will be helpful. Um, see, I, I grew up and was raised under that whole helping model. So I'm a, I'm a child and product of the late 50s, early 60s. And so when all that, you know, community service, help one another and all that, well, I grew up under that model. Um, so whether I've worked in business or education, I've always kind of taken that with me. And so these kinds of presentations, for me, give me an opportunity just to continue to act. That's one more way for me to act on that. So that's what I do.